now my pleasure to invite Ms. Marcela Villarreal, the Director of the Office for Partnership, Advocacy and Capacity Development at FAO, to deliver her speech. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, partners. I am truly delighted that uh, FAO has become a full-blown partner in this Baku process, which we believe is quite important and has a fantastic road ahead of it. And I think that working together, we will be able to dent into uh, this major problem that the world faces today about food insecurity. As my predecessors have said, uh, there is around 800 million people who are chronically undernourished in the world. What does that mean? 800 million people who go to bed hungry every night of the year. And this happens in a world that produces enough food to feed each and every one of them. So the issue is not an issue of production, or should I say not only of production, it's an issue of how these people will be able to have access, effective access to this food. And this is not all. Uh, we produce enough, but we need to still increase the production to accommodate population growth from here until the year 2050. So we know that population is going to grow to up at least to 9.1 billion people by that year. And we calculate at FAO that food production needs to increase by 60%, more or less. And this is in a world without climate change. But we know that climate change is here and it is a major and massive threat. It compromises food security and it may even compromise the future of the world uh, to be able to feed itself in the future if we don't come up with um, imaginative solutions. So where does intercultural dialogue come into the equation? Let me add another angle to what my predecessors have so eloquently said already. There's around 250,000 plant species in this planet. 250,000 is a big number. Throughout history, human history, humans have cultivated 7,000, either cultivated or gathered. The basis of human nutrition throughout all of our humanity has been, you know, 7,000 plant species. Today, we cultivate only 120 of those. And actually, around 75% of all human calories come from four, which are wheat, maize, potato, and rice. Whatever, say what, uh, what could happen with climate change or with any major catastrophe that we lost one of these? What would happen to the people who depend on these to, for, to eat? So 7,000 plant species, we only cultivate 120. What happens with the rest of the 6,000, however many, 6,880 species? What happens with those? Well, those are the ones that we uh, call underutilized or neglected crops. They have a fundamental uh, role during crisis, and we know that, uh, as my predecessors have mentioned, we are in the verge of famine, um, threatening around 20 million people today. But these, so this is a underutilized food species are a major source of food during crisis and famine. They are a source of household income. Uh, they contribute to, especially to the poor. They're mostly used uh, to, by the extremely poor, but they grow in very difficult environments. Uh, they are better adapted uh, to local agroecological conditions. Uh, they are better ad adapted to, for example, drought or excessive water. And uh, therefore, they have a massive, massive value in the verge of climate change. However, throughout our modern history, they have not received the benefit of the, say, mainstream uh, agricultural research systems, they've been actually neglected or uh, put aside. Um, the international research system has, and also in a very important way, has basically focused on some monocrops that were quite essential to get the world out of famine when uh, there was a massive population growth in the years 60s and 70s. So of course there's a great value in this international agricultural research system. And actually agriculture has a very, very high component of knowledge. Knowledge is fundamental for all of agriculture. And of course, research is fundamental uh, for agriculture too. Traditional knowledge has been elaborated by indigenous communities, by local communities, by 
uh, people around the world through thousands and thousands of years. It's been elaborated sometimes in many elaborate ways, in complex ways. Let me give you the example of cassava. Many of you know cassava, especially those uh, of you who come from Africa. Uh, it is a crop that was uh, originated in, uh, in the tropical areas, actually in the Amazon jungle. Today, it's the major source of carbohydrates for around 500 million people. Half a billion people uh, use cassava as, a, as their staple crop. It is resilient, it is drought tolerant, it can grow very well in poor soils. However, cassava, you may know, uh, has a particularity. It is highly, it contains a very, very highly toxic cyanide. You will immediately equate cyanide with poison. It's actually a poison and it has a high component depending on the variety. But some varieties have a very high component of cyanide, the amount that would kill a human being or that would leave the person physically impaired throughout life. But it's a major crop, I said, for many, many people around the world. Well, throughout years and years and years, the people of the Amazon forest developed through their local research a methodology that takes out all the poison of cassava and so that it can be safely eaten by everybody. Well, this is indigenous research that took place over thousands of years, very sophisticated ways because of course there is a trial and error. So if there's a lot of poison, <laughs> do you really want to try to see if <laughs> you're taking out enough poison and you're probably going to die? Well, it's happened through many, many uh, years. And so with many neglected species today, there's traditional knowledge that is fundamental Without traditional knowledge, cassava probably couldn't be eaten. It would just poison people. So there's a huge value to this traditional knowledge. The problem is that traditional knowledge is being lost. Traditional knowledge is a m fundamental part of culture and it's being lost. Somebody, some people equate the loss of this traditional knowledge uh, to the speed of the loss of language. We know, and uh, we, are, we have many UNESCO colleagues who will give us the actual figures, uh, but at, according to uh, some sources, there's around 3,000 languages that are in danger of extinction, and that there's more than 600 languages that have already become extinct. When a language becomes extinct, the knowledge, those years of knowledge that have been, have, has been elaborated within that knowledge, within that language, also is lost to humanity. And that knowledge could be essential in times of crisis and all the more so in times of changing conditions like that, that climate change is going to uh, bring to us. So how is it that we are going to try to recuperate this traditional knowledge that could even be the answer for the future food security of the world, which means the answer to the survival of human species in the world? Who knows? How is it that we're going to recover that? Well, the only way is through true intercultural dialogue. It's the only way. How do we do an intercultural dialogue between systems of knowledge? And here we're talking about systems of knowledge, one system of knowledge that has been dominant, which is the international research, agricultural research systems, it's, it's been the, the, the dominant system. Uh, it is today the, the dominant system. How can they get in touch with the systems of knowledge, of traditional knowledge. It has to go through a revalorization of traditional knowledge. There has to be a true dialogue where both parties are ready to learn from each other. We can't go like normally development processes go in a top-down way. There's somebody who will come from a fancy ha uh, capital in, an, in a nice airplane and tell people, don't do this this way, you have to do it this other way, top down, you know nothing, I know everything, just do what I tell. That's not going to work. It simply doesn't work. Here, the intercultural dialogue, what we'll bring is basically a possibility of gaining knowledge by both parties through listening to each other. And that means that both systems of knowledge need to be recognized as legitimate and as providing important sources of knowledge. So accept that we can learn from each other, accept that we don't have the only knowledge, 
accept that other systems of knowledge are legitimate, are valid, and that actually have the keys to um, many of the situations the world is living in and that we may not even know. Now, I'm talking about dialogue between cultures and actually dialogue between systems of knowledge. And the system of knowledge is obviously produced by a culture. And that's actually an important part of the culture itself. Well, how about within the culture? Within the culture, we have men and women. And men and women in many different places have different systems of knowledge and different understanding. There's a lot of knowledge around agriculture that is transmitted from mother to daughter. There's a lot of knowledge that's transmitted from father to son, and they're complementary. So usually many, and this is something, and maybe Esther will tell us later on from the point of view of uh, the farmers, so many times the extensionists talk to the men, they don't talk to the women, they just talk to the men and ignore the knowledge that the women have and also ignore that the women are many times the main farmers. However, if we don't have men and women talking to each other and the knowledge of men talking to the knowledge of women, we may be not only losing part of that knowledge, but actually losing that system of knowledge with that complementarity of knowledge that is so fundamental uh, for the system itself. Now, what I'm uh, arguing is that if we don't talk to each other, more if we don't recognize the value of others of the other as we have said before of their different knowledge of how that knowledge can contribute to our own knowledge we uh, may be putting our own humanity in a very very big danger because in times of crisis as i said before and very specifically in time of climate change or other kinds of threats to the agricultural system as a whole, that possibility of talking to each other may have the key to future survival of all of us, of the human species. So from the point of view of FAO, we're absolutely delighted to be a partner in this endeavor to use and promote intercultural dialogue as a way of understanding each other be better, of promoting food security and of promoting hopefully the future of humanity. This is why we're so happy to uh, call on you to join us in the meeting that our ambassador Leila Lieva mentioned that we are going to be hosting in Rome uh, together with the a UN AOC and with the support of the Azerbaijan uh, government. You're all invited and I hope that we will see each other at that time to be able to continue this dialogue. Thank you for your attention.